power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger King of glory King above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder leaves us breathless in our wonder King of glory King above all kings This is amazing grace is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life then I would be set free Jesus I sing for all that you who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the open a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. With truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place Bear my cross. You lay down your life, and I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. When I rise 
in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise give me Jesus give me Jesus give me Jesus When I am alone When I am alone Oh, when I am alone Give me Jesus Give me Shadows put to flight. Re- 
Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Who comes out of nations by in one the hearts of all? Now our sad division cease Then be thyself our King of Peace Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel Rejoice, rejoice Give 
stand for this last song.
Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Who by, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Father, Father, we are so thankful that by your mercy, by your grace, you have called us into a living hope, and that because you live, that you have bestowed upon us resurrection life that begins here and now and carries us right on into the next age. This really is, Father, the living hope that we have that soon, someday soon, we will be looking into your face, into your eyes. What a glorious thing, Lord. But until that time, you've called us to take up our post here and to represent you well here, to be living hope here in this age, in an age that's filled with darkness, that's filled with death and dying. And so, Father, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would enable us to do this well, at every turn, to offer the hope of salvation to others. And, Father, we pray for the kiddos across the way. Right now, Lord, they're gathering, they're worshiping, little hearts are being directed back to the gospel of Christ, and we pray, Lord, That little lives this morning, some of them not so little anymore, some of them are growing into big lives who have many things going for them, Lord, and we pray that the the most important thing about their lives would be found in who they are in you, that they would understand this, not just at a head level, but at a heart level, and it would shape their lives right now, Lord. We pray for those who don't know you, these young kids who maybe uh, either are completely unaware of you are indifferent towards you or are simply hostile towards you, Lord, that, the, that the, uh, the message of the gospel this morning communicated through the workers, the volunteers, and through Debbie's department, it would transform people's lives this morning, we pray, Lord. And we pray for ourselves as we enter into the holiday season. Uh, there's so much frenzy. There's so much activity, Lord. We pray as your people that we would come back again and again to the truth of the Christmas message, the incarnation of Christ. God became one of us. <laughs> stunning, really stunning news, Lord. We pray that your people would be about that message this season, and we would live that out well in the upper rogue, we pray. We trust you for this. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. And the uh, teen ministry, which is the junior high and the high school students, you can be dismissed at this time. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning to everybody who's uh, at home. Hopefully you're in a place where there's not any fog. It's been kind of depressing, has it not? Sheesh. Well, it's good to see all of you are right back in your typical seats. <laughs> Amazing. You are right back. I can't believe it. Nobody dared brave a new seat, did you? I'm looking at it, you guys. No. Oh, what? Okay. What? Good for you, Donna. There's a couple of you. Uh, the brave ones. I don't know. I'm going to venture out. I'm going to try something new this morning. A whole new seat. One seat to the left of where you normally sat. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> Good work. Um, isn't it great just to be able to worship together and hear each other's voices? Yeah. It really is wonderful. And as Rick mentioned last week, um, this morning we're starting a new short four-week series uh, leading up to help set our hearts and our minds to celebrate the birth of Christ. And the message of Christmas is good news to a weary world. And our world is weary right now, is it not? You feel it in your, your own souls, don't you? How weary the world is. The, the message of Christmas is good news. And unfortunately, the message of Christmas in our culture, in our country, has been swallowed up to a large extent by the commercialization of Christmas. It's become a secular festival of lights. It's become a time of family gatherings and a season to give generously to those closest to us and to those in greatest need. And those things, those are, those things are right and good, and they're congruent with the origins of the Christmas celebration. But the true message of Christmas is far greater. It's far more glorious than the secular offerings. The true message of Christmas is that with the birth of Christ, God has come. With the birth of this child, God has come to rescue and redeem humanity and the creation itself. The true light has dawned. And he will expel all of the darkness of the world. All of the sin, all of the suffering, all of the evil he will expel by absorbing it himself. He will bring ultimate peace by absorbing sin, by absorbing suffering and death. And he will extend free grace as a gift to anyone who will receive him. This is the real message of Christmas, and it needs to be recaptured in our culture. And anybody who slows down enough to really read the full accounts of the birth of Christ and the implications of it, anybody who slows down enough to read it really, to really slow down and read it, and to consider all the implications of it, well, what happens is they become overwhelmed by it. It's what led a French poet in the mid-1800s who was far more well-known for his wine consumption than his church attendance. Some of you are thinking, I know people like that. <laughs> Let a, p a French poet, uh, far more known for his wine consumption than his church attendance, to pin one of the most famous Christmas hymns. He was challenged, encouraged by his uh, parish priest, to read the Gospel of Luke, the accounts of Christ's birth in the Gospel of Luke, and to write a poem concerning it. And he did, and he was overwhelmed by what he read. And he, what he pinned is a Christian uh, Christmas hymn that you know very well. O Holy Night. And it captures the meaning of Christmas. It completely captures the meaning of Christmas. And you know the opening line so well. Listen to it. And you're going to want to start singing him. <laughs> but don't. Because he didn't write the music. He just wrote the, the lyrics. So here's what he wrote. He says, O Holy Night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Now listen. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks 
a new and glorious morn. Some of you are singing it. I can, I can hear you. And you know the hymn. He tells of how this king was laid in a manger. But then in the third stanza, in the back half of the, the poem, he writes this. Listen to it. About this child who was placed in this manger, he says, He, he knows our need. To him, our weakness. No stranger. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Isn't that glorious? That's somebody who understands the gospel. You see, the real message of Christmas is with the birth of this child, God's long redemptive plan of rescuing and redeeming humanity will finally and fully be realized. It's like you're looking through a long, dark tunnel of humanity, and all of a sudden you see this bright light. There's light at the end of this tunnel that humanity has been in since the fall of Adam and Eve. But this light is dawning, and it's getting brighter with each step you take. This is, again, glorious news. And like I said, it's the best news. It's the best news for the weary world. And so what we're going to do is we're going to jump out of the Gospel of John that we've been in for the last several months, and we're going to jump into the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to look at the full account of Jesus' birth as told by Luke, and we're going to let it prepare our minds and our hearts to worship Christ the King this Christmas season. So, Luke chapter 1, I hear your turning pages already, that's excellent. Luke chapter 1, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 26 through 38 this morning. And it's one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. It's it's so well known that the challenge for you this morning is to read it without turning off your brain. Um, That is the challenge. Sometimes when you come to certain sections of Scripture that you know really, really well, you kind of it kind of you glaze over. Um, Don't do that with this passage because this passage has surprising things in it for all of us. So Luke chapter one. Verses 26 through uh, 38, 26 through 38, and I, I want you to see it with fresh eyes, and I want you to see how Mary responds to the message of the incarnation, and let her response shape our response to the message of Christmas. So, beginning in verse 26 in Luke chapter 1, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin, betrothed to a, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. So Luke tells us that the Lord sends this angel Gabriel to Nazareth. The Nazareth, it's a tiny little village. Uh, 200 people, max would probably be 300 people. A small little community. And you know how small little communities are. Everybody in a small little community knows everybody else in all of their business. And so the Lord sends Gabriel there. And he sends Gabriel there specifically to see Mary, who's betrothed or pledged to be married. And, and, and uh, she's pledged to be married to Joseph, and she's a virgin. Now, you need to know, and you probably do, that Mary is incredibly young. She's a young, young girl at this point. Uh, she's between the ages of 12 to 15 years of age. Most girls were um, betrothed right after puberty. So maybe she's 12, maybe she's 13, maybe 14, at the tops, uh, 15 years of age. And that just, uh, every time I I, I think of that, it startles me because my oldest daughter is 12 years of age and she's about to be 13 years of age. And and I just think, how would the news hit you if you were 12 or 13 years of age that Mary's about to receive? So she's, she's incredibly young, and she's pledged to be married to Joseph, who, by the way, is also really, really young, maybe a bit older, maybe 15. And the way this worked was Hebrew parents arranged, um, arranged the marriages of their kids, arranged the marriages of their sons and daughters. And once the decision was made to pursue a match, the families got together, the fathers discussed every detail, tokens were exchanged, vows were exchanged, and then in a very real sense... 
um, by all, for all purposes, they were, really, they, they were really married and family celebrated. And at the conclusion of this ceremony, they entered into what was called a betrothal period. And it lasted as short as a month. It could last up to a year. And again, they were legally married at this point. They were husband and wife in every way except that they had to live in their respective families' houses and they had to refrain from sex. But again, they were legally married. And therefore, if anything came up that they said, we, if something catastrophic were to happen, that they couldn't stay married, which was highly unusual, they would have to go through the legal process of divorce. So at this point, Mary is betrothed, and she's no doubt feeling all of the excitement that engaged women feel as they're preparing for their wedding. You who are married, ladies, you remember being engaged. You remember how excited you were, don't you? If your husband's sitting next to you, go up and down, just, just for show. <laughs> you remember, you were, you were thrilled, you were over the moon, it consumed all of your thoughts. Your wedding day consumed your thoughts. That's what you were thinking about 95% of the time. You couldn't wait. You were so excited. You were writing your new last name. You were doing all, all of these things that engaged people do. And Mary's probably, no doubt, feeling all of these things. She's making her plans. Her wedding day's approaches. She's looking forward to the day that her and Joseph would get to live together as husband and wife. And they were so close to that day when... Gabriel appears to her. And what he says to her completely rocks her world. Look at verse 28. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now look at verse 29. But she was greatly troubled. Note that, underline it. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This is startling news that that Gabriel gives to Mary. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Okay, so Gabriel shows up and he shares this just absolutely startling news with her. That though she's a virgin, she'll conceive. And she's going to give birth to a son through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Gabriel tells her three amazing things about her son. He tells her first in verse 35 that her son's character will be holy. Look at verse 35. He says, Gabriel says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, which means this is the direct direct action of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. So her child's character is holiness, which is only God's character. So this is holiness personified. This is God in the flesh. His character is holy. And then Gabriel says that the child's vocation will be that of a king. Look at verse 32. Gabriel says, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. The Davidic covenant, 
will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So this child born to Mary is going to be the true king, the Davidic king, the one that Israel's been longing for. And, and Gabriel says, of his kingdom there will be no end, meaning there's never going to be an election. He's never going to go off the throne. His kingdom will continue to endure and expand as more and more people come under his kingship. So his character will be holy, his vocation will be a king, and his purpose will be to save. Look at verse 31. God, well, look at verse 31. Um, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall give, you shall call his name Jesus. So God chooses the name of this son, Jesus. And Jesus, as you may or may not know, uh, Jesus is the Greek form of the name Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. And in Matthew's account, an angel comes to Joseph, and remember, he says, he says, um, he says concerning Mary, your fiance, she's with child, and you're going to name that child Jesus, for he's going to save his people from their sins. So therefore, now look at this. Look at what Gabriel has just told her. This young girl, the king of the universe, her child, is given the name Savior. So all of his holiness, all of his deity, all of his power Stand in, his save, in, stand in the service of his saving power, his saving mercy. This child, born to Mary, who was God in the flesh, entered into his own creation to be a holy, divine, saving king. This is why Christmas is good news. This is amazing news given to young Mary, startling to say the least. And look at her response, her famous response. Look at verse 38. Mary said, behold, after asking how can this be, and more, more information given to her, Mary says, or after hearing more about this child, Mary says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Look at that response. <laughs> I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you've said. That's amazing. And Luke includes this section, no, bow, no doubt, because of the announcement of the incarnation of Christ, but also because of Mary's response. And Mary's response serves as a pattern for how we should respond to the message of Christmas. So how does Mary respond? That's the question. Because her, her response to this message should shape the way you respond to the Christmas message. So how does she respond? Let me give them to you up front and then we'll work our way through them. How does she respond? First, she considers the message carefully. When she hears this, she, she, well, she considers it. She thinks about it. I'll show you how in a second. She considers it carefully. Secondly, she surrenders completely. She surrenders completely. So first, she considers it carefully. Second, she surrenders completely. Third, she sings joyfully. In the back end, and we'll see in a moment, she sings joyfully. So the first one, she considers carefully. Her mind, now catch this, her mind is fully engaged. She considers all of this very carefully, and her mind is fully engaged. A lot of people um, who don't believe in Christ, when they encounter people who do, they'll look at them and they'll say, oh, well, you're just one of those people. All you religious people, you just accept things with blind faith. You don't really take time to consider it. Well, nobody, nobody could ever accuse Mary of not really considering this because an angel appears to her and, and what does Luke tell us? Does Luke tell us that she's overjoyed by this? No. He doesn't say anything about her being, oh, this is such great news. He doesn't say that at all. We don't, re we don't read Mary saying, how wonderful. I've been waiting for my turn to talk to an angel. I've been waiting. All my other friends have talked to angels. How come I can't? We don't read anything of the sort. What do we read? Rather, we read the opposite of that. Look again at verse 29. The text tells us, verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what kind of greeting this might be. So what's she doing when she receives this message? She's thinking about it. 
She's thinking rationally about the message. The word discern in the ESV, or it's um, in the NIV, it's wondered. It's a Greek word which means to make a settlement of accounts. It means to reason. It's an accounting word, which means you're adding things up. You're trying to make sense of things. You're trying to think rationally, clearly, um, making sure everything adds up. You're thinking with good reason. And of co- Now think about it. Of course Mary was troubled by this news, as any rational, normal person would be with an appearance of an angel. If an angel appeared to you all of a sudden, you would be troubled at this, th- at this sight. You would react just as you, she's reacting just as you would if you saw an angel. And she's thinking to herself, am I really seeing this? Um, what is happening right now? Is this a, a hallucination? What is going on? She didn't immediately, now catch this, she didn't immediately accept the message. She's processing. So she's thinking rationally about the message. But also note that she thinks skeptically about her own skepticism. She thinks skeptically about her own skepticism. Her initial reaction was one of skepticism. The first time she heard the gospel message, she said in verse 34, how can this be? How can this be? That's a really polite way of saying, what? <laughs> huh? There's, that's impossible. Well, why would she say that? Because she had been trained by her culture. Now listen, she had been trained by her culture not to believe that God could become a human being. Remember, Jews wouldn't even pronounce the holy name of God. So everything in her culture, everything in her culture, mitigated against the idea that a human being could be God. And in our culture, you and I have been trained ever since elementary school not to believe in the supernatural. We've been trained in philosophical naturalism from a very early age. So everything in our culture mitigates against the idea that God could become man. Everything in our culture mitigates against this. So Mary is not, that, not all that different from us. She finds this message incredibly hard to believe, just as many people in our culture do. She responds with skepticism, but the question of how will this be, now catch, the, how, the question of how will this be isn't the question of a closed mind, but it's a question of an open mind, which means she didn't stop the conversation. She kept the conversation open, which means she examines her own skepticism. And one of the healthiest things we can do is to examine our own skepticism. She, she's skeptical about her skepticism. She pulls out her skepticism and asks, do I really believe everything my culture has told me about this? Instead of living with a closed mind regarding this, maybe I need to come at this with an open mind and consider it. And for us in our culture, it's a really healthy process to examine why you might be skeptical regarding the supernatural. It's a really healthy process for Americans to say, why am I actually skeptical against the supernatural? You might want to ask, do I really believe, look out at the world and say, do I really believe that all of this is an accident? My culture tells me it is. My professors tell me it is. And yet, 90% of the people that I know don't actually believe that this is an accident. Why why should I believe that it is an accident? Um, Maybe it isn't an accident. Maybe there is a God. And if there's a God... Could he actually intervene into the universe that he created in order to rescue it? That's a good question to ask. Another question might be, do I really believe that I'm just a grown-up germ? No, maybe I don't believe that really. See, it's a good idea to be skeptical of your own skepticism. And and with Mary, our barriers are different. The the barriers that Mary faced against belief in the Christmas message, you need to see this. They're as every bit as big as the barriers you may be facing as you contemplate the Christmas message. But note the path to faith that we see in Mary. She doubted. Are doubts okay in the Christian culture? Oh, well, heavens, yes. They're actually wonderful. Because oftentimes our doubts open up the doors to real answers. So she doubted. She questioned. She used her reason, her intellect, 
And she continued to ask questions. Now listen, that's the path to faith. You want genuine, lasting faith? This is the path. If you and I are going to have genuine faith, if the Christian message, and if the Christmas message is going to make any difference in our lives, we have to journey down the same path, the same path as Mary. Question. Um, Use your intellect. Reason. Think some more. Ask some more questions. Your doubts, it's not like you can force doubts. They're there regardless. Get more, ask more questions, but continue down this, this road because that is the path to faith. So first note that Mary responds to the message by considering it carefully. It's a whole person experience that includes the intellect. It's a whole person experience, the Christian faith. It's a whole person experience that includes the intellect. But note, secondly, she surrenders completely. Her will is fully released. After she reasons this out and thinks it through and asks questions and wrestles with her doubts, she surrenders, her, she surrenders completely and her will is fully released to the Lord's plan. Look at the most famous line in the account in verse 38. Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Now, note what she's not saying here, please. Um, she's not saying it's all so clear now. <laughs> she's not saying, I get it. It's, it's so perfectly clear. She's not saying that. She, nor is she saying, I really love this plan. <laughs> uh, did you know sometimes you don't have to love all the, little, the Lord's plans for your life? You can go through seasons that you're just like, this is, not, this is not something that I would have chose for myself. And that's probably, at a, there was a point in Mary's life that she thought that. This is not the plan that I would have chosen for myself. But what she does say is, even though all of this doesn't make sense right now, I will pursue this. I will trust you. Which means Mary surrendered her will to God, even though she knew it was going to cost her. Remember, she lives in a small little village. And people aren't stupid. They're going to do the math. They're going to say, married on this day, baby born on this day. Hey, wait a second. Something's not adding up. She knew Joseph wasn't going to believe her. That there was going to be heartache in her relationship with Joseph. She knew that all of her friends in her community, tiny little village, they're not going to believe her. And they're going to shame her which in that culture was worse than death. That she knew that her child, Jesus, would be called a bastard, which he was, John chapter 8, verse 41. She knew all of these things. She knew everybody in her little community would think that either she had sex with Joseph before marriage or she ran around on Joseph, uh, committed adultery on Joseph. And she knew, that all, she knew all of these things. And yet she says at verse 38, I am the Lord's servant. Whatever may come, Lord, whatever may come, I will accept it and I will trust you with it. And the reality is, anybody who wants to become a Christian must essentially do the exact same thing as Mary here. Anybody who really wants to become a Christian must essentially do the same thing becoming a, because becoming a Christian is not a program to help you self-actualize. It's not a program for you to live your best life now. Christianity is not a vendor service providing you spiritual goods that will engage you, that you'll engage as long as it meets your needs at a cost that's reasonable to you. Christian faith is not that at all. It's not a negotiation Christian faith is a surrender of your will, just like Mary did here. But note this, you're releasing yourself. When you come to Christ, what you're doing is you're releasing yourself to the king of the universe whose character is holy, whose kingdom will never end, and who uses all of his power, all of his saving mercy at your disposal. You're coming to the king of the universe who is completely holy and who you can trust completely. 
You're coming to that king and you're surrendering yourself to that person completely. That's how you come to Christ. So the message, look at how Mary responds to the message of Christmas. First, she considers it carefully. Her mind is fully engaged. Second, she surrenders completely. Her will is fully released. And then lastly, she sings joyfully. Her heart is fully captivated. Her heart is completely captivated. Well, where do you find that in this passage? I don't. It's actually in the next passage that Rick's going to teach next week, and it's a great passage, so I'm going to jump into it. Um, look, at verse, look at verse 46. He'll do a better job next week, but we're going to just look at it real quick because it all flows together. Look at verse 46. Mary says this. She considers all this. She's, she considers it. Again, note the path of faith. She considers it carefully. Her mind is fully engaged. She surrenders completely. Um, her will is fully released. And then she sings joyfully. And this is, this is the path of faith. Her heart is fully captivated. And she says in verse 46, my soul, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now the soul and the spirit in the Bible, those aren't two different things. Um, this is parallelism. This is a literary device. Um, to make an emphatic point. And what Mary's saying is the message of this child, the message of this child and who he is and what he will do, it has moved me to the depths of my, of my being. Her mind is engaged. Her will is surrendered. And now, finally, her heart is captivated. And true Christian faith, it always moves from mere mental assent to a surrendered will to a heart that's filled with joy just like a young child's heart on Christmas morning when they've received a gift. That's the mark of a Christian heart. One of the marks of someone who truly understands the gospel at a heart level is this perennial note of joy because they know that they've received a gift that they couldn't earn and they didn't deserve. They didn't deserve. This is why Mary sings. And she says in verse 49, go ahead and look at it, she, she continues to sing in verse 49. He who is mighty has done great things for me. <laughs> she looks at this child and she says, he has done great things for me. Let me ask you, can you sing that? Can you say that along with Mary? This child has done great things for me. For me. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve this at all. This is, a, this is a gift. His grace given to me is a grift, is a, simply a gift. Now, again, look at the response of Mary here. She considers it carefully. Her mind is fully engaged. She surrenders completely. Her will is fully released. And third, she sings joyfully. Her heart is fully captivated. Now, let me ask you this. Isn't that how you want to be as we move into Christmas? As we move into this Christmas season, isn't this the way you want to respond to the message of Christmas? So how can we, like Mary, not just hear the Christmas message, but how can we actually be transformed by it? How can we not just hear it, but be transformed by it? Let me give you three ways. Here's the first way. you got to let your weight down on the evidence. you got to let your full weight down. You want to be transformed by the message of Christmas? Let your full weight down on the evidence. A lot of people will read this account and they'll say, well, Mary, that's great for Mary, but she had an angelic announcement. Anybody, given that, would of course believe the message of Christmas. Of course she believed. But don't you see, friend, you have so much more than Mary does. You have way more than Mary does. Mary has a brief encounter with an angel. You have so much more. You don't just have an announcement from an angel. You have the evidence of a life lived. She has a brief announcement. You have the evidence of a life lived. You have the New Testament authors telling you about this one. Because this child grows to be a man. And both his friends and his enemies declare that he was the son of God. In uh, John, John chapter 6, Peter says... One of his friends says, we have believed. He says this to Jesus. We've believed and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And then at the cross, one of his enemies, the soldier who stood by as Jesus died, said, truly, this was the Son of God. So, listen, you want the, 
message of Christmas to transform you. Let your weight down on the evidence and know that you have way more evidence than Mary, or, yeah, than Mary ever did. Unlike Mary, we have the full story. We can read the vivid narratives. We can see Jesus' love for humanity. We can feel the weight of his teaching. So my friend, let your weight down on all of the evidence that this baby promised to Mary, born in a stable, truly was God in the flesh. He came all the way down and was placed in a cradle and then went to the cross where he knew his obedience to the Father would plunge him into unfathomable darkness. But he did it so that he could bring you into the light of his eternity. And he willingly did it. Every step of the way, from the cradle to the cross to the eventual crown, was done with you in mind. And if you want to be transformed by the Christmas message, let your weight down on the evidence. Let your weight all the way down on the evidence. But then secondly, let your soul be caught up in the wonder of it all. Let your soul be caught up in the wonder of it all. Do you guys remember the name Harry Reasoner? I can tell how old you are by if you remember the name Harry Reasoner. Anybody in their 40s is looking at me with this blank stare. But if you're older than 40, I didn't know who he was until a couple of weeks ago. A friend gave me a story. Um, If you don't know the name Harry Reasoner, Harry Reasoner was a journalist who was one of the first co-anchors of uh, 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace. And then later on, he worked at ABC News. Excellent journalist, won a bunch of Emmys and a Peabody Award, so he's an excellent journalist. And on, on Christmas Eve, 1973, in the midst of the growing turmoil over the Watergate scandal and the troubled economy and wars and rumors of wars, he closed out that, that night's broadcast with these words. And it's a lengthy quote, but you're an intelligent person. And we only have one service, so we can go... All day. (laughs) So Reasoner closes out ABC News on Christmas Eve this way. He says, as you know, it's Christmas. The basis for this tremendous annual burst of gift buying and parties and near hysteria is a quiet event that Christians believe actually happened a long time ago. You can say that in all societies, there has always been a midwinter festival and that many of the trappings of our Christmas are almost violently pagan. But then you have to come back to the central fact of the day and the quietness of Christmas morning, the birth of God on earth. It leaves you with only three ways of accepting Christmas. One is cynically, as a time to make money or endorse the making of it. One is graciously, the appropriate attitude for non-Christians who wish their fellow citizens all the joys to which their beliefs entitle them. And the third, of course, is reverently. If this is the anniversary of the appearance of the Lord in the universe in the form of a helpless babe, then it is a very important day indeed. It's a startling idea, of course. My guess is that the story that a virgin was selected by God to bear his son as a way of showing his love and concern for man is not an idea that has been popular with theologians. It's a somewhat illogical idea, and theologians, who sometimes love logic more than they love God, find it troubling. That's a great line, by the way. It's so revolutionary a thought that it probably could only come from a God that is beyond logic and beyond theology. It has magnificent appeal. Almost nobody has seen God, and almost nobody has any real idea of what he's like. And the truth is that among men, the idea of seeing God suddenly and standing in a very bright light is not necessarily a completely comforting and appealing idea. But everyone has seen babies, and most people like them. If God wanted to be loved as well as feared, He moved correctly here. If he wanted to know his people as well as rule them, he moved correctly here. For a baby growing up learns all about people. If God wanted to be intimately a part of man, he moved correctly. For the experiences of birth and familyhood are our most intimate and precious experiences. So it goes beyond logic. It it is what Bishop Carl Morgan Block used to call a kind of divine insanity. It is either all falsehood 
or it is the truest thing in the world. It either rises above the tawdriness of what we make of Christmas, or it is a part of it and completely irrelevant. It is the story of the great innocence of God the baby, God in the form of man. And it is such a dramatic shot toward the heart that if it is not true for Christians, well, then nothing is true. And Reasoner says, so even if you did not get all your shopping done, and you were swamped with the commercialism and the frenzy, be at peace. And even if you're the deacon or the usher, having to arrange the extra seating for all the Christmas Christians that you won't see again until Easter, <laughs> be at peace. The story stands. It's all right, he goes on. It's all right that so many Christians are touched only once a year by this incomparable story. Because maybe, just maybe, some final quiet Christmas morning, the touch will take. Because the message of Christmas is the Christmas story. If it is false, we are all doomed. If it is true, as it must be, it makes everything else in the world all right. Isn't that wonderful? It's a wonderful, wonderful quote. Now listen. Such a long quote, I have to put it back there. Uh, it's, listen, maybe you came here this morning and you're not sure about Christianity. You're not sure why Christians get up for Christmas. You're not sure about any of this. Fine, okay, fine, I get it. Trust me, I get that. But can you at least acknowledge that deep in your soul you want it to be true? Can you at least acknowledge deep in your soul you want a holy God, a God who is rich in mercy and power, who uses all of his power in the act of his saving mercy. Can you at least admit you want that to be true? A God who will deal with all of the evil and suffering that humanity has caused. Don't you want that God to finally and fully set the world right? That she, don't you, can you at least acknowledge that you want to know God and more than that, be known and loved by God? If you can at least acknowledge that, start right there. Start right there, wherever you are, whoever you are, start right there and come to see that in the birth of this child, promised to Mary, God has intervened. He has intervened, and you can be fully known and fully loved. So start right there and then stick with us as we move through the Christmas season. And if you're already a Christian, how can you be transformed by the message of Christmas again? Be caught up in the wonder of it all, all over again. Honestly, you have to be caught up in the wonder of it all, all over again. The really staggering Christian claim is that God became one of us. The second person of the Godhead took on human flesh and lived as one of us in order to die for us and save us from ourselves. That's the really staggering claim. And he gives us his grace as a gift. He, he became one of us to rescue you and to redeem you. So f let that story meditate upon it until it fills you up with wonder and joy this Christmas season. So how can we not just hear the Christmas message but be transformed by it? First, let your weight down on the evidence, not just an angelic an announcement, but the full evidence of a life lived. And the witness of all the New Testament authors. So let your, let, your, uh, let your weight down on the evidence. Second, let your soul be caught up in the wonder of it all. It's the true story. The Christmas story is the true story of God intervening in his creation and setting the world right, starting with the people in it. And then lastly, let your mind meditate upon and your heart be stirred by the Lord's love. Let your heart really, as you ponder these things and you're caught up in the wonder of it all, let your mind meditate all the way on it and let your heart be stirred by it. Be stirred by the Lord's love. Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I know I'm running along, stick with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, when he's reflecting on Christ's love, he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that by his poverty you might become rich. Which means his grace, the Lord's grace, given to you, is a gift that's born out of his love. Just like the gifts that you give your kiddos. They're gifts, the gifts that you give your kiddos, they are real gifts, but they're, born, they're a tangible expression of your love. 
This is what Jesus is in our lives. It's a tangible expression of, of the Lord's love. And you know what happens when you really take time to meditate upon the Lord, upon the Lord's love, and you allow your heart to be stirred by it? What happens is over time it transforms you. It'll enable you, the more you meditate upon the Lord's love given to you in Christ, his grace that you receive as a gift, the more you meditate upon that, you let your heart be stirred by it, it'll enable you to live gratefully, knowing that your relationship with the Lord is based in his grace, which is rooted in his love. So it will enable you to live gratefully. But then secondly, it will enable you to live selflessly. It'll enable you to live selflessly. The Christmas spirit, that which our world tries desperately to manufacture this time of the year, that which people think, well, I'll just, I'll lubricate myself with enough eggnog and then I'll be, I'll get into the Christmas spirit. No, 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 no. The Christmas spirit, that which we try to manufacture, that will be the mark of you all the year round. Listen to the words of J.I. Packer. I'll close with this. He says, the Christmas spirit does not shine out in the Christian snob. <laughs> For the Christmas spirit is the spirit of those who, like their master, live their whole lives on the principle of making themselves poor, spending and being spent to enrich their fellow human beings, giving time, trouble, care, and concern to do good to others in whatever way there seems need. There are not as many who show this spirit as there should be. If God in his mercy revives us, one of the things he will do will be to work more of his spirit into our hearts and our lives. You want the message of Christmas to transform your life? I hope you do. And if, and if you do, then you've got to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Welcome him into your life as Mary did. Consider it carefully. Please consider, consider it carefully. And then surrender your will completely and then be caught up and sing joyfully. Receive his grace as a gift to this Christmas. Amen? Why don't you stand? We'll sing. We'll sing, right? I'm not doing a cappella, right? <laughs> That's all me. <laughs> that would not get us in the Christmas spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray as we enter into the Christmas season, and Lord, we know, oh boy, do we know how frantic, uh, how frenzied the activities are this time of the year. Um, we move about at such a quick pace trying to accomplish all these other things that some of them are all they're good and right, and yet some of them are just busyness. We pray that you'd give us discernment so that we'd be wise, wise enough to really slow down and meditate upon the truth of the incarnation. God became one of us. The king entered into his creation to draw us back, to offer us his grace as a gift. Please, Lord, enable this message to fill us once again with wonder and to move us out in boldness, offering and extending your grace as a gift to others who desperately need to hear it. We thank you, Father, for this time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we do pray that as we move into the Christmas season, that we would adore you more and more for the work that you have done, for your willingness to come all the way down in the form of a helpless babe to save us, to rescue us from ourselves, Father. Please help us, Lord, in this season to really focus in on you. Let the name of Jesus Christ be honored among us, we pray. And as we go back into our homes, Lord, with our kiddos and our families this afternoon, back into the places where we work tomorrow, Lord, we pray that at every turn, the good news of the gospel, the the staggering news of Christmas would come pouring out through our lives, over through our lips, out through our hands in acts of service to others. We trust you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.